you ask a disagreeable person what he wants, say, or she wants, they'll tell you right away. They, they know. It's like, this is what I want and this is how I'm going to get it. But agreeable people, especially if they're really agreeable, are so agreeable that they often don't even know what they want because they're so accustomed to living for other people and to finding out what other people want and to trying to make them comfortable and so forth that it's harder for them to find a sense of their own desires as they move through life. And that's not, look, there's situations where that's advantageous, but it's certainly not advantageous if you're going to try to forge yourself a career. That just doesn't work at all. Even though on average men and women don't, aren't that much different in terms of their levels of agreeableness by the group, if you go out and you look at the extremes, they're very different. So all of the most agreeable people are women and all of the most disagreeable people are men. And the thing is the extremes are often what matter rather than what's in the middle. And so one of the ways that's reflected in, in society, by the way, is there's way more men in prison. And the best personality predictor of being imprisoned is to be low in agreeableness. It makes you callous. Now, you may think, well, what's the opposite of compassion and politeness? And the answer to that is, I think it's best sort of conceptualized as a, as a trading game. So let's say that we're going to play repeated trading games. And if you're very agreeable, then you're going to bargain harder on my behalf than you're going to bargain on your own behalf. Whereas if you're very disagreeable, you're going to do the reverse. You're going to think, I'm in this trading game for me, and you are going to take care of your own interests, where an agreeable person is going to say, no, no, at best, this is, at worst, this has to be 50-50, but I'd like to help you every way I can. One of the things you have to be careful of if you're agreeable is not to be exploited because you'll line up to be exploited. And I think the reason for that is because you're wired to be exploited by infants. And so that just doesn't work so well in that actual world. And one of the things, one of the things that happens very often in psychotherapy, people come to psychotherapy for multiple reasons, but one of them is they often come because they're too agreeable. And so what they get is so-called assertiveness training. Although it's not exactly assertiveness that's being trained. What it is is the ability to learn how to negotiate on your own behalf. And one of the things I tell agreeable people, especially if they're conscientious, is say what you think. Tell the truth about what you think. There's going to be things you think that you think are nasty and harsh, and they probably are nasty and harsh, but they're also probably true. And you need to bring those up to the forefront and deliver the message, right? You shouldn't work at cross purposes to your temperament because it's just too damn difficult. But having done that, then you should work on developing the, the skills and, and viewpoints that exist in the space opposite to your personality, because that's where you're fundamentally underdeveloped. And that way, I think you can extend out your temperamental capability across a wider range and to me that's roughly equivalent as bringing a richer toolkit to each situation you know so if you're hyper extroverted you should probably learn to shut up at parties now and then and listen just to see what's going on to see if you can manage it and if you're introverted well then you should learn how to speak in public and to and to learn how to go to parties without hiding in the corner and saying nothing to anyone you no know? and if you're agreeable then you need to learn how to be disagreeable so people can't push you around and if you're disagreeable you learn you need to learn how to be agreeable so that you're not an evil son of a bitch. and the same thing applies even in the conscientious domain. It's like if you're too conscientious, you need to learn to relax and let go a little bit. And if you're unconscientious, it's time like get out the Google calendar, man, and start scheduling your day and beat yourself on the back of the head with a stick until you're disciplined enough so that you can actually stick to something for some length of time and not living in absolute squalor, which is something that would characterize someone who's very disorderly, for example, because they just, they don't notice. It doesn't bother them disorder. Maybe they can see it, but it doesn't have any emotional valence, and so it doesn't have any motivational significance. The other thing you might want to think about, too, if you're choosing a partner, is try not to choose someone who's too distant from you on the temperamental variables, because you're going to have a hard time bridging the gap. It's hard for an introverted person and an extroverted person to coexist, and it's really hard for an orderly person and a disorderly person to coexist, because they will drive each other nuts. Why don't you pick up? Why are you so obsessed by it? That's the basic argument. It's useful to know about your temperament so that you can negotiate the space with your partner as well. And you should try to find someone who's exactly the same as you because then you don't have the benefits of the alternative viewpoint. But you gotta watch it because you may hit irreconcilable differences of various sorts. I've seen that most particularly among couples who are high and low in openness. That's a rough one. And also high and low in conscientiousness. That's another rough one because they just cannot see how the other person sees the world at all.